All right, welcome back and thanks for tuning in again. So today we're gonna revisit this rusty crusty Onan MDJE gen set. In the previous video on this thing, we uh, managed to get it running. Only ran for about 30 seconds because we didn't have any cooling system for it. So what I'd like to do today is kind of rig up a temporary cooling system so we can run it for a decent amount of time. And then uh, take a look at the generator end and see if we can actually get this thing making power and if we can, we'll put it under a load. So let's get started. Now I've taken a few minor steps since the last video. Uh, mainly, I mounted this bracket back on the engine and this held both water pumps. See, we've only got one sitting on here now. The other one is inside on the bench. We'll look at that in a sec. I don't think we're gonna use this pump. Uh, this is the, uh, this would be the raw water pump, the seawater pump with a rubber impeller in here. We're not gonna use that. We're only going to use the centrifugal pump, uh, which would handle the engine's coolant. Uh, this bracket also supports the uh, governor spring here, and then the adjustment bolt, the tension bolt. So, kind of necessary for uh, the rest of the operation. You can see now the uh, governor lever is under tension. I think that's about it. Uh, the only other thing I've done is. I kind of, uh, I filed down the bottom of the thermostat housing to try to flatten it out. It was a little bit, uh, not warped, but had some pitting on it. Obviously we're going to have to test the thermostat. Little thermostat there and make a new gasket. Interesting that the thermostat sits on top of the gasket. Can you see that? A little bit of gasket paper remaining there. The thermostat little flange sits on top of it. And then there's a a little counterboard area in the thermostat housing that holds the flange. See that? Let's go take a look at that water pump. All right, well, I've disassembled the centrifugal engine coolant pump. It's a little uh, Oberdorfer, if I pronounced that correctly. Oberdorfer, okay. And uh, I guess that's the model number right there. 50, and you can't read that, can you? 50P-15. Uh, it seems to be in fair shape. The bearings are pretty much shot. The, uh, the whole thing was really tight. That's really the reason I disassembled it. The bearings were very, very tight. Uh, with a little bit of uh, heat applied in this area, I was able to uh, get them freed up, and I dribbled a little bit of oil down the seal area there. And they, they spin freely enough. They definitely are going to need to be replaced. I can't take them out uh, without removing this pulley because I have to get to a uh, internal snap ring back here. And I have a feeling that this little stamped uh, steel pulley is gonna have to be removed destructively. I tried some time to get to, uh, to remove it off the shaft, but you can't really get a puller on here uh, because you're just gonna bend the pulley. Anyway, other than that, I think it's uh, gonna be in fair shape. The ceramic face of the seal here seems to be decent. And then the mating half of the seal here seems to be fine. Uh, interesting, the, uh, there was another internal snap ring here which was broken. Here are the two pieces when I uh, removed the pump. Don't know how that happened. But we're going to go ahead and put this back together, just as it is, and it should allow us to uh, get the thing running, even though these bearings are on their last legs. All right, let's do that and put it back on the engine. So I've made a little progress here. Take a look at the thermostat housing. We've got some new hardware there. That looks good. Thermostat, I went and I tested this thermostat. It begins to open at about 165, and it's fully open at 180. Let's see that uh, V180. I'm guessing that indicates the temperature. Made up a new gasket there. This cleaned up nice. Got that water pump put back together and mounted. Uh, I'm using, a, uh, this is the wrong belt. This is like a, I think this is a B section belt. Looks like the groove is fairly narrow, so probably calls for an A section belt, but I don't have any of those laying around. The pump uh, has, uh, I guess it's easier to show you up here. We got these long elongated slots for adjusting tension. 
and just a plate with two threaded holes in it. So I'm going to connect all the plumbing for this with just some of this uh, cheap half inch vinyl tubing for now. And uh, I think the next clip will be ready to fill it up with water and uh, start it up. Well, here's our super simple cooling system. We're just going to have a five gallon bucket of water for the uh, engine to circulate. Now, of course, that's going to that's going to get hot relatively quick and our runtime is going to be short, but it's certainly going to be longer than with no cooling system at all. You can see we got water flowing there. Got to open the bleeder up here. Just take this all the way out. Have to have the bucket elevated here since uh, that centrifugal pump won't really be able to prime itself. Should see some air coming out of there or some water any minute now. Oh, oh there. Oh, I think I see it. Yep, got water coming out the bleeder. That's good. The thermostat, the thermostat itself doesn't really have any bypass or any bleeder, so this uh, hose is going to be dry here, the uh, outlet, until it gets up to temperature. Here's our setup for testing. We got our fuel. We're going to have the, uh, the torch handy because it was a bit chilly last night and the block is still cold. We're filled up with water. In lieu of a temp gauge, I've got this uh, meter here which does have a thermocouple in the bucket here and right now we're at 33 degrees water temperature so a little bit chilly I think it should still fire off uh, without too much trouble let's give it a shot just set you up here Ooh. Huh, well, I think that battery's no good. Okay. <laughs> I guess that battery doesn't like the cold either. Stand by. Alright, well, the battery's been on charge for a while. It should start up without too much trouble. It really warmed up out, so, I mean, it should be a bit more inclined to start than it was earlier. We'll still use the torch just for the hell of it. She's putting away there.
doesn't sound too bad at all, does it? Huh, you know what? I thought I think well, I think I see some bubbles flowing up here. The vinyl hose is really uh started, you know, loosened up from sitting in the sun all day. That stuff's like hard as a rock when it's cold. Obviously, it's not running at rated speed. Let me grab a, uh, let me grab a meter and we'll put it on the output of the generator so we can get it up to rated speed. Okay, well, while it's sitting here idling, I want to speed it up a little bit and crack the injector lines one at a time to kind of get an idea of how much work each cylinder's doing. Pretty much make sure they're both firing. It should be able to run on one cylinder. are doing their part. Let's bring it up to rated speed. You know what? I think I see some water circulating already. Oh, you know what? I already see some steam. There's some steam on top of the bucket over there. The thermostat must be flowing a little bit of water. Let's bring it up to uh, 60 hertz. There should be enough residual voltage output from the generator, even with the regulator disconnected, to get a frequency signal.
Now we're starting to steam now. Hey, look at that, 184. See, I got the probe stuck right in the uh, upper fitting there. Now, the outside of the bucket is still cool to the touch. Yep, the water up top's hot though. Like the diaphragm of that lift pump is probably leaking. See the fuel sitting on top of it? I've got my meter leads on the E1 and E2 wire which I believe that's one side of the uh, generator winding. So under normal operating conditions, they'd have about 120 volts on them. I got about 10 volts residual, nine or 10 volts. That's good. Well, let it run for a while. Sounds good. Well, I think we've determined we've got a pretty decent engine here, and uh, it's time to concentrate on getting this generator end working. Taking a, you know, just a quick glance at it, seems to be in pretty fair shape. The windings uh, don't seem to have suffered any uh, corrosion or physical damage. This is the, these are the stator windings where the actual power is produced. The windings in the center here on the rotor uh, can make up the field. So this is the generator field that induces power into the stator, the stator windings. The field is fed direct current through these two slip rings here. We got the brushes pulled off. Make sure that they're free in their holders. They don't seem to be worn. Really, they, they seem to be in fine shape. Uh, let's see. So, we will, uh, we're going to check those windings with the mega here. Make sure we don't have any uh, shorts to ground. And uh, we'll take a quick look at the magnesiter here. If this works, we're going to leave it alone. If it doesn't work, we'll go in more depth into more depth uh, in troubleshooting it and discussing how it works. I am not an expert on these Magnesiter voltage regulators. They're quite a fascinating device. Um, it's really one of the early solid state voltage regulators uh, for small gen sets, and I mean they use these on these little ones all the way up to you know two two fifty kW units, I think. Uh, they use these on but uh, really it's it's pretty simple it's uh, got uh, really no electronics to it other than a few rectifier diodes that's really the only semiconductors on it a couple of ceramic resistors wire round wire wound resistors that's about it I've got some uh, prints here of the construction of the magnesiter it's really a neat device um, we'll go over the general parts right off the bat so here's a print for this model magnesiter. This is a, we got a little number there, 04SX. 
that is the reference number here, the O4SX. So, the two big coils, one at the bottom, one at the top, Onan refers to those as gate reactors. And then we got a little one on the side here that they refer to as a control reactor. So, simply put, you got AC power which passes through these reactors, but only one half of the AC waveform. So you got this top one will handle one half of the AC waveform, the bottom will handle the other half. And that's when I say AC, that's these two wires here which come directly off of one of the output windings. That is the sensing and the power for the magnesiter. And then that each half of that AC waveform which it's no, lo it's no longer AC at that point, it's pulsing DC, it's going in only in one direction, is sent through the field winding, causing the field obviously to become electromagnet, and as it's spinning, it, it's inducing a current in the stator winding. So the power that's being fed to the field is also, well, it's also controlled by these uh, gate reactors, because there's more than one winding in here, uh, has a little bit to do with the control reactor, you might guess. Um, depending upon the voltage level that's applied to the input of the magnesiter, a control voltage will essentially buck the current, that the field current that's passing through these reactors, and a bit of a balance is formed, almost like a governor, like a mechanical governor, uh, which limits the field current based upon the applied AC voltage. And there's a little band on the side here, a little bit of adjustment here, so you can adjust the output of the generator by moving this band up and down, which, let's see, it might be a bit hard to find here. This print makes it a little bit easier. That's the adjustment right there. Um, you know, feel free to pause the video and study this if you like. I found these prints, this one, I did not draw. This is not a factory Onan print. This was drawn up by uh, one of the guys over on Smokestack, the uh, the antique engine website. There's quite a few uh, smart guys there, and one guy reverse engineered a magnesiter to make this nice print. Here's a factory Onan print, a little bit uh, more difficult to decipher. And this is a just a general control schematic for a similar model generator to this. So this is the control that this unit would have been fitted with originally. The only reason I have this printed out is because we've got our two sense wires and then we've got a third right here, wire 35. All right? That wire comes in, passes through here, passes through, and pops out as wire 9, I believe. So that is a field flash. And how it was wired up originally is this wire made its way all the way back to the starter solenoid so that when the engine was cranking 12 volts was applied to this wire came through the generator popped out here went to the magnesiter and that directly flashed the field to allow the thing to make AC power well allowed a little bit of AC to be generated to feed the magnesiter to get it to start regulating the field input or the input to the field I don't know if we're going to need that, to be honest with you. I mean, we had about 9 volts residual on these wires at running at rated speed. That might be enough for the thing to start regulating on its own. We'll see. And uh, the other wire, the other small wire, is the battery charging circuit, which is extremely simple on these gen sets. Let's take a look at that print. Oh, it blew away. Sorry about that, the microphone came unplugged. We're back though. All right, let's take a look at that battery charging circuit real quick. It's extremely simple on these older Onans. Let's move over this way. So we got this big power resistor right in the, uh, this is the air discharge from the, the cooling air from the generator end. So we got a big old ceramic resistor here. 
we got a wire on the end this guy right here which goes up into a dedicated winding in the generator the other end of that winding pops out as one of these leads seven or nine I don't remember let's take a look here at the print so there's our wire wound resistor the movable band just goes right to ground that's this guy right here the movable band one wire here jumps right over to physical chassis ground so that's one termination of the coil of the wire goes through the resistor goes up to the generator passes through a specific winding in the generator runs right on up to the terminal strip which is wire 7 terminal 7 runs through a single rectifier diode which converts the AC that's produced in this winding to half wave rectified DC passes through the diode back through the terminal strip and run right up to the charging ammeter extremely simple no regulation at all uh, when the battery hits a certain voltage that equalizes or that equals the voltage output of the system the thing stops charging because there's no voltage differential all right well I think that's about enough yapping on that for right now let's set the mega up and uh, we'll check these windings out Here's our setup for testing the stator windings with the Mega. Uh, if you haven't seen this tool being used before, this is a, essentially it's just a generator. Really, it's a hand crank generator that is regulated to about 500 volts, and it's got a high resistance meter here, ohmmeter. So we've got all the way down at the bottom, we got zero or dead short, starting at 100,000 ohms going right on up to a thousand mega ohms and infinite or completely open circuit so what this tool is going to do is well, how we have it wired up is it's going to apply 500 volts between the output windings the stator windings and ground so we've got one lead this red lead going right to a bolt on the frame the other black lead is just twist it onto one of the output wires of the stator. Going to this wire only is going to test the entire stator winding because we got two ends of well, one end of each winding tied together here and the other end of each winding is tied together in this little tape ball which is insulated so that's just gonna lay right there and we know that we know that this is the output because they are labeled T1, T3 and the others are T2 and T4 and we can take a look at the the wiring diagram that was underneath of the cover for the control box we are wired for single phase two wire 120 only because T1 and T3 are jumped together and that's the output and T2 and T4 are jumped together to an output they would also be uh, bonded to ground in that case so I think we're ready to do it I'm looking for between 10 and 20 mega ohms at least uh, to ground so very little leakage let me zoom in on the scale there hopefully that's legible for you so I'm just gonna crank this handle over here rapidly and you'll hear the uh, there's a slip clutch in here that will limit the speed that's applied to the generator regardless of how quick that I, I spin it so the first thing I'm going to do is take a screwdriver here on the output terminals, short them together, and crank the, crank the handle over slowly just to bring the needle to zero or dead short. It's going to go right over there, barely any cranking. All right, so I'm going to crank it for 30 seconds, and we're going to see what the needle does. It should swing up and settle out. If you, can't, if you can't see, we got 10 and 20 uh, is pretty much dead center of the scale. So 15 is dead center. We want to be in that neighborhood. Above 10 uh, would be what I would prefer. Let's, get, let's go ahead and crank it.
Looks like we settled out at about 125 mega ohms. So that's good. That means the insulation integrity of the stator winding, the output winding, the most important winding, is good. The only other winding in this thing, well there's two more, there's the charge winding, which I'm not that concerned about, and the main rotor winding, right there. For that, we're just going to simply use a digital voltmeter, volt ohm meter, and read resistance between one of the two slip rings, doesn't matter which one, and ground. When I say ground, I mean the shaft, the generator shaft that the rotor is mounted to. The shaft is the rotor. So I'll do that off camera. Not much to see there. As long as it's a couple mega ohms, you're good. You don't want any leakage. Uh, resistance through this winding should be in the neighborhood of 3 ohms. Um, if you have a digital voltmeter, that'll be pretty easy to determine. An analog voltmeter, depending on how accurate it is, might be a little bit harder to see. But that's good. I think, I think we're ready to mount these brushes back on and hook everything back up and give it a try. Well, once again, we're starting to run out of daylight. But we got it all hooked up, got the load bank connected. I've also uh, cleaned the glow plugs since the last clip, tested them. They both seem to work just fine. We're going to try to start this without the torch, just using the glow plugs. It's probably about, about 40 degrees out. It's not super cold, but I'm gonna go. I got my text machine here. We're gonna start that. We're gonna leave the glow plugs on for one minute. Starting now. Make sure my microphone's plugged in, yep. And uh, yeah, one minute, we'll give it a run of the glow plugs and we'll see if it starts on its own. Hasn't been run in, oh, probably three days. I think it'll start up. They, these draw about six amps a piece at 12 volts. We got a pretty good battery there. The starter does seem a bit weak. The magnesiter is all hooked up. I got my voltmeter here. I'm gonna watch the voltage as we start up. Got my starter button, 45 seconds. If it starts, we'll leave the glow plugs plugged in until it's running on its own, then I'll pull them. Almost there. Okay, that's one minute. She's trying to hit on both cylinders. I think we got a little bit of air in the system. Yeah, every time I take that, uh, that suction line out of the bucket, you know, we induce air into the system. We're making voltage though. We know it'll start with the glow plugs. Make a voltage almost bang on. What was it? 238, 239? Ah, look at that. 240. The 
governor is still bouncing around a little bit. into it and then we'll apply some load ah, sometimes I gotta laugh this is quite the setup huh we got a bucket of water a battery laying on the ground some wires all strewn about but we're running let's start putting some load on it watts worth of load. I'm going to have to keep an eye on that bucket. I left the garden hose out so we can add cool water if, um, well, if and when that uh, bucket exceeds uh, about 150 on the return to the engine. Let's put another two on it. about 4,000 watts. The governor is hunting a little bit. We could probably adjust the sensitivity a little bit and get that out. We're not going to worry about that right now, though. This is more of a test of the the generator end itself and the engine, rather than its rather than being very critical of its ability to maintain speed. Proof of concept is what I'm saying. some moisture in that uh, jacket around the exhaust. Sounds pretty good. It is still cold. Now let's put another 2,000 watts on it. All right, that's 6,000 
fucking lots. is uh, getting pretty crackly. Let's bounce it around a little bit. We'll drop that 6,000 watts off and put it back on in one step. So we can let it run like that for a little while yet. Yep, yeah, I think we got a winner here. I tell you what, that frequency drip's not even that bad. not tweaking that governor sensitivity at all. Yeah, not bad at all for a small unit like this.
Well, I'm I'm about to call this a good a success. Yeah, I am very satisfied. The Magni Cider is working perfectly. She built up voltage, no problem, without the automatic flash. will see this is when we go ahead and install it in my truck. Let's put 7500 back on it just for the heck of it. One step load response, one step to 100%. Can't argue with that. All right, well, hope you found this video enjoyable. I sure do appreciate you watching. Take it easy. We'll see you on the next one.